Tonight, I want to focus on this man by the name of Apollos, and uh, I guess for no other reason, because of the phrase that's used in verse 25, where it says that this man, Apollos, was fervent in the spirit. I want to preach to you about a man that's on fire, a man that's on fire for God. And this word fervent is a good Bible word. It's a, it's a word that you want to uh, put in the top of your vocabulary of words that, that maybe define you and define me. Fervent means to be boiling, to be red hot. Uh, biblically, being fervent is being biblical, and being biblical is being fervent. Uh, being fervent is being red hot for Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 11 says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. I love reading that because when you read Romans 12, it talks us about, uh, about giving our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. It speaks about the grace of God that has abundantly given us spiritual gifts to serve him. And Romans 12, just alongside of uh, 1 Corinthians 12, speaks speaks about the spiritual gifts that God has given to us. Every one of us in this room that are saved, you have one or more gifts that God has spiritually given to you for serving him, that is for the benefit of this local church. And by using your spiritual gift for the benefit of the local church, it's to help our church be a spiritually holy church and a, spiritual, and a spiritually healthy church there. Now the Bible says in the exercise of that work, we're not to be slothful in business. That means we're not to be slow. We're not to procrastinate. We're not to, we're not to, uh, we're not to waste time. We're not to drag our feet. Uh, the Bible says the king's business requireth hate. Not slothful in business. Don't drag your feet when it comes to serving God. Amen. Not slothful in business. Not deliberating. Should I do this or not do this? Have faith in God. This is not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Titus 2.14 says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself a peculiar people zealous unto good works. Now I don't know the last time you read Titus 2 14. I love that verse. I've preached often off that verse. You know what that verse is telling us? No more than that verse is telling us we're saved. How many are thankful tonight you're saved? Amen. Who's redeemed us? For, he's redeemed us. Amen. We are saved. That by that verse tells us not only we're saved, that verse tells us we are special. We are a peculiar people. That doesn't mean you're weird and you're, you're whacked out. It means you're special unto God. But it also means we're a sizzling people. We're saved. We're special. We're sizzling. He says we're to be zealous of good works. The word zealous is the same idea of being fervent, that we're boiling over. You You've boiled water before. You've turned the water up. You've watched water boil. God wants us to be boiling over with Jesus Christ here. I like to think of this verse, Titus 2, 14, also saying that we're forgiven, that we're favored, and we're to be fiery, that God wants us to be on fire for God. How many feel like tonight you need a fire lit under you, amen? We need a fire lit under us to serve the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this verse, we look at what we're reading tonight about this man by the name of Apollos. We are blessed and we're to be boiling. We are forgiven. We're to be fiery. We're a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, it's my prayer, and I was praying that this week as I was preparing for the message. Lord, help our members and our attendees at Heritage Baptist Church to be a people that are boiling over, to be people that are not thoughtful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. God, help us as a church that we're excited about Jesus Christ. We're fervent in spirit. We're fervent about the things of the Lord. We're fervent about the Easter services coming up. We're fervent about the treasure hunt. We're we're fervent about coming to church. We're fervent about singing. We're fervent about listening. We're fervent about doing things for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at this man, Apollos, He's mentioned here, he's mentioned in 1 Corinthians, he's mentioned in Philemon, but many, much of what we know about Apollos is right here in Acts chapter 18, and we want to look at this man, Apollos, a man on fire. Notice several things that the Bible tells us about this man who was on fire for God. Notice, first of all, in verse 24, Apollos was a man that was equipped. Apollos was a man that was equipped. The Bible tells us that he was a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. Now, as we stop there for a minute, we want to consider the fact this man immigrated from Alexandria of Egypt over to Ephesus and eventually made his way to Corinth or the Isle of Achaia there. Alexandria, Egypt was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. Alexandria, Egypt was a hub of education and scholarship. Alexandria, Egypt had perhaps the largest library at university in the Roman Empire with a library boasting 700,000 volumes of books. It was a city of scholars. It was a center of education. In fact, it was a place of higher learning and a philosophy. It was a city founded by Alexander the Great. It was perhaps a... Um 
It was the cutting edge city of that time. It was a place of education. It was a place that attracted many Jews. It was highly populated with Jews. But it was also a place where there was much learning and there was much question to Betty. You might want to write this down. Alexandria was the location where a corrupted, uh, a cor corrupted manuscript of the Bible came out. A corrupted manuscript. This corrupted manuscript is one that some who have, have seized hold of that and have used that corrupted manuscript for the translation of ver versions of the Bible that are not consistent with the Textus Receptus that we use for the Greek translation there. Uh, the, the, the city of Alexandria was the place where the, the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text of the Bible, was translated into Greek. We call that the Septuagint. Now, Alexandria, I want to thank God that, that Apollos came out of Alexandria, but there was a lot of corrupted things, a lot of worldly things that came out of Alexandria. But thank God, in that great met, met, metro, uh, metro, metro uh, I can't say it, this great city there, metropolis there, that, uh, that this man Apollos was born there, he was learned there, he was grown up there, and he was equipped there. Now notice several things about this equipping. When we say equip, we're talking about the fact that Apollos was prepared, uh, he was trained, and he was ingrained. He was equipped. You know, the business of the church after you get saved, we're to evangelize and then we're to equip you. The business of the church is to give you the tools that you need to grow in Christ and to serve the Lord. Can I hear an amen about that? Amen? You come to church here, our goal is to equip you. You get involved with our club. And listen, if you've got a young person you ought to get that young person involved in our club ministries because you know what? Our teachers and sponsors are involved in equipping. If you're not involved with a growth group, you need to enroll in a growth group because in that growth group, our teachers are trying to equip you. We're trying to give you the tools and essentials you need to, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this man, Apollos, this man, we see several things about him. Look at verse 24. He was equipped, number one, in the scriptures. The Bible says, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, and eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. Now I love that phrase there. He was mighty in the scriptures. He was taught in the scriptures. He was ingrained in the scriptures. He was discipled in the scriptures. He sat under the word of God. He was mighty in the scriptures. Now what does that mean he was mighty in the scriptures? Well, we didn't have all of the New Testament re re revelation at the time, but they had the Old Testament. What that tells me, he was well versed and trained in the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the books of the Old Testament. He knew the men and the women of the Old Testament. He knew the he knew, the, he knew the prophets, and he knew the kings, and he knew the patriarchs. He knew Moses, and he knew Joshua. He knew the judges. He knew Jewish history. He knew the prayers, and he knew the miracles. Uh, he knew God as Elohim. He knew God as El Shaddai. He knew God as Adonai. He knew God as Jehovah. I'm just saying today, when it says he was mighty in scriptures, he knew his Bible. He was mighty in reciting the Bible. I want to ask you a question tonight. Are you mighty in the scriptures? Are you mighty in the word of God? Are you spending time in it? Are you soaking up God's word? Are you hungry for God's word? Or do you come to church just to soak and to sit or to receive and to put into action? This was a man who was mighty in the scriptures. He was equipped in the scriptures. But then secondly, we see something else here. The Bible says in verse 25 that he was instructed in the way of the Lord. Now I asked you to underline the phrase the way of the Lord and the way of God. The reason why I asked you to underline that because in the Hebrew mindset, the way of the Lord and the way of God spoke specifically about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it spoke about knowing the path of salvation and believing that what was written in the Old Testament scriptures about the way of the Lord, about Jesus coming, and I'll give examples, Psalms 22, Isaiah 53, or the types of the Bible that speak of salvation, uh, he, uh, Exodus chapter 12 about the Passover lamb, or you read through Leviticus about, about the sin offerings and things like that, that everything in symbol type speaks about our Lord there. Now Jesus seized on that when we get to John chapter 14, and Jesus seized on that by saying, let me say to you, I am the way the truth and the life, no man cometh to the Father but by me. When you read through the book of Acts in those early days as the church is, is expanding out there across the, that, uh, that, that Middle Eastern area, the, the, the believers were called the way, which described them as believers in Jesus Christ. And you might say here, as we look at this man, Apollos, he was minding the scriptures, but he was instructed in the Lord. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. He was instructed about Jesus Christ. He knew the Messiah, but he didn't know, as we read this, he didn't know that Messiah had 
had come. He was well instructed of the scriptures. He knew the word of God there. So here was a man whose heart was burning about the word of God. But not only that, the Bible not only says he was mighty in the scriptures and he was instructed in the way of the Lord, but notice something else here. The Bible says in verse 25, it says, and fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Would you know this? Would you underline this? Knowing only the baptism of John. Now, he, had, he didn't have complete knowledge. I don't want to say that he didn't have complete revelation, but he didn't have complete knowledge that Jesus had come. He somehow came under the influence of the preaching ministry and the baptism ministry of John the Baptist because the Bible wants us to know, knowing only the baptism of John. He understood that John preached a message and emphasized repentance towards God and preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Now, he was right on board with that. I mean, he was on board with the fact the Messiah has come, and it's during my generation the Messiah has come or will come, and John the Baptist has paved the way. And it might be that that fiery spirit that, that we read about here that, that uh, Apollo's got, it may be it would just kind of passed on to him because of some of the disciples of John the Baptist. They themselves were also fiery there. Whatever it may be, that fervency rubbed off on Apollo's and Apollos, because you know, John the Baptist was called a burning and shining light. And Apollos knew only about the baptism of John. Now, that does, that's not a bad thing, but that's not a good thing. He was, he was limited in his understanding, his knowledge about the way of the Lord, that he knew about the way of the Lord. He knew the Bible prophesied. I believe if you sat down and had a conversation with Apollos, he could tell you, well, I know Isaiah 7, 14, that, uh, that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. I believe that he knew about Isaiah 9, 6, that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father the Prince of Peace. I think he knew the Psalm 53 about the fact that, that he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace would be upon him. I think he knew all those scriptures. I knew that there. I think he knew that there. And he came under the influence there. He studied his Bible. He knew in Isaiah chapter 40 that Isaiah 40 prophesied about John the Baptist. And he, I think he knew Malachi chapter 3, that Malachi chapter 3 prophesied about John the Baptist. And so the Bible says here, he knew only about the baptism of John. I mean, just Apollos and his emphasis there was this. He followed the, the same pattern as John, as John the Baptist in preparing men's hearts for the coming of the Messiah. He preached about the Messiah to come, not realizing it come. But this man was fervent. He wanted people to be prepared for the Messiah. Here was a man that was equipped in the Scriptures. But notice something else. He was not only equipped in the Scriptures. As we read verses 24 to 26, he was equipped in speaking. Now listen, down there to Alexandria, he came under some, some, some Jewish believers and some believers who understood the Lord. He came under the influence of some of John the Baptist, uh, some of the, his disciples who influenced him and their and their fiery spirit kind of rubbed off on him but he learned how to speak he learned how to be he learned how to uh, to be eloquent about the things of God notice what the Bible says in verse 24 he was an eloquent man he was a gifted orator he was an articulate speaker he was a passionate speaker he had a, he was a convicting and compelling and a, and, and, a, and a compelling speaker he had great speaking and preaching skills that he put to use he chose his words well he emphasized his words well I believe he brought Brought water to thirsty souls. He spoke in such a way that he stirred up people's souls that they knew that they were thirsty within and they wanted the water of life. I believe as he preached that he was kind of the plow that broke up the fallow ground and made the ground ready to receive the engrafted word which is able to save souls. I believe he got people's hearts ready. I believe this man as he was eloquent speaking, he could speak in such a way that he could capture your attention and capture your imagination and thrill your heart about the things of God. I don't know if any of you ever heard the preaching of Dr. W.A. Criswell. Dr. Criswell well, was a prince of preachers during the 20th century. He was a Southern Baptist for the, for, for the most part. But many, I, many friends that I've known, men have gone on to glory, have told me that they believe if Chris, that Criswell, if he had the opportunity, he probably would have left the Southern Baptist Convention and would have become independent like us. He was an eloquent speaker, an eloquent man of God. His predecessor, George W. Trude, was an eloquent man of God. Uh, I think of Dr. Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was an eloquent man of God. Some of you might remember the days when we had Dr. Raymond Barber, when his health was good. Dr. Raymond Barber came and preached in our church. He was an eloquent man of God. This man was eloquent. Now I like to say this. It's good for us to take what we've learned and to polish it and work on it and speak eloquently about the Lord Jesus Christ and speak eloquently about the things of God. And this man, this man Apollos, he was eloquent in the scriptures. He knew how to present the scriptures in such a way that it touched people's hearts there. But the Bible says this also. It says in the same verse there, it says, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Now that would help us as teachers. Teaching diligently the things of the Lord means he taught with accuracy and exactness. 
The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divining the word of truth. Uh, he was a man who showed himself approved unto God. Now listen, teachers, <laughs> teachers, you, you can't be halfway as a teacher. You got to go all the way. You've got to study it out. You've got to get the resources. You better know your Bible. You better know the person you're speaking about there. The Bible says he taught diligently. Listen, thank God we give you manuals to help you teach, but you need to go beyond the manual. Get yourself a concordance. Get some Bible history. Uh, come talk to some of the men in the church who have been around the Bible a little bit here, and let us help you because you need to teach diligently the Word of God. Listen, if all you're doing is regurgitating the lesson, that means it hasn't got your heart. You need to get your heart. Somebody help me with that tonight. Amen. You need to get your heart tonight. We need, to be, we need to teach diligently the Word of God. Now, the word diligently is also translated in Ephesians circumspectly. Let us walk circumspectly with preciseness and wisdom and exactness and accuracy. Uh, you know, the, the Word of God, when we're preaching it, is like, is like an archer that has taken an arrow out of his quiver. He's put in that bow, and he's aimed it. He's aiming as a skillful archer at that target. His goal is to hit a bullseye every time, every time he lets it go there. This man taught diligently the things of God. All that, what I'm saying tonight, Apollos was a product of being equipped. He was, he was equipped. Now, we don't know who his teachers are. We don't know who his mentors were, but somebody invested in that man's life. Somebody invested in him and equipped him. May I tell you tonight, young people coming up in the church and older people here tonight, thank God for people that are investing in your life. Amen? You all thank God for men and women that are investing in your life. They're equipping you. They're pouring their hearts in you. They're teaching you how to preach. They're teaching you how to teach. They're teaching you how to have a heart for God. They're teaching you to be devoted. They're teaching you how to be separated. They're teaching you how to live for Christ. They're trying to keep you out of sin. You ought to be thankful tonight for men and women that are trying to equip you to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, this man Apollos was equipped... Uh, I think what happened to him is what the Bible emphasized in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11, 12, that the Bible says that, that God wants us to be equipped to be perfect, perfect, and mature men and women of God. I think it emphasizes 2 Timothy 2, 2, that where we, uh, the things which we've heard among many witnesses, the same we're to commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Listen, the, our ministry will not go past this generation if we're not involved in investing and equipping the next generation to serve Jesus Christ here. I want you to have a burden to equip your children. I want you to have a burden to equip our young generation. I want you to have a burden. I'm going to be preaching soon from the book of Titus about sending things in order. And one of the things we need to get interested in is to be burdened and concerned about the generation coming up that we're equipping them, preparing them. That listen, maybe in this church, there's a young man in this room tonight that God is preparing to be the next Apollos to preach and touch his generation for Jesus Christ. Amen? Look at chapter 18, verse 23. That's what Paul was doing. The Bible says that Paul had been there on there in Ephesus, and God led him to, to leave Ephesus after, after three years there. He spent three years there, and, he, and then, he, and then he, he took off. And the Bible says there, uh, it says in verse 22 and 23, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up, he saluted the church. He went down to Antioch, and then from Antioch, he, there, he went there. He, the Bible says, and after that, he spent some time there. He departed. This is Antioch of Syria, where his ascending church was. He spent some time there, giving a report. He was on, back on furlough there, giving a report to the church. Church. Verse 23 says, he departed from Antioch, and it says he went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Hey, listen, Paul had a burden for the believers and churches that he helped start churches in. And if you know your geography, that area of Galatia was the northern part of Turkey. And so on the western side of Turkey was Ephesus, where he'd been ministering for three years. That, that's modern-day Turkey. Some of our members just got back from a trip over in that area there. And so he goes, down, he goes down southwards to Antioch of Syria. He spends time there at Antioch of Syria. He's equipping the believers there. Now he feels led of God. He needs to go up to the northern part of Galatia. And he's going there. The Bible says strengthening the believers. What's he doing there strengthening them? Well, he's, he's teaching them doctrine, but he's equipping them to serve the Lord. Now, it's one thing to get your, your mind all set and to get Firm in your mind about what you believe. But listen, you need to take what you believe and what you've heard and turn it into action and to serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ there. And so Paul, Paul was equipping. And this man, Apollos, was a man that was equipped. He was equipped for serving God. He was equipped in the scriptures. He was equipped for speaking. Now, Apollos was equipped. But notice something else. We go to verse 25, and the Bible says, this man was instructed 
and the way of the Lord. And I want to go to that phrase I asked you to underline, and being fervent in the Spirit. Now, Apollos not only was equipped, Apollos was exciting. How many like to be around exciting people, amen? I mean, I like to be around people that are bubbling. I like to be around people that are happy. I like to be around people that are, that are, that are th- thrilled about the things of God. They've got a little amen in them, amen. They got a little bit of hallelujah in them, amen. I mean, they got the praise of the Lord inside of them. You say, well, pastor, I'm a little bit stoic and I'm a little bit, I just don't get emotional. Well, you need to get emotional, amen. God, we have an emotional God, amen, you know. And we just need to be a little emotional there. You need to be excited about the things of God. The Bible says that Apollos was boiling over in spirit when he got to Ephesus there. The Bible says, he got to Ephesus, and the first thing they noted there, that he was boiling over. He was fiery in the spirit. He got there, and then when he went to Corinth, the, 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 the whole characterization of Paulus was that he was a man that was very eloquent, but very excited about the Lord. I want to encourage you tonight, be exciting, amen? Be fervent in the Lord. I mean, be fervent about your gifts. Be fervent about good works. Be fervent about the gospel. Be fervent about the grace of God. Uh, Be fervent about giving. Be fervent about God's grace. Be fervent about glory that we're going to heaven. Amen. I mean, let's be a people that are fervent about the things of God. We ought to be excited about Jesus. We ought to be excited about heaven there. I told the church I was preaching at this past week there, I was reminded what I tell you sometimes. I said, you know, sometimes we feel like Paul, like he was in Philippians chapter 1. We feel like we're torn between two worlds. On one end, we, we want to be here. On the other end, we know, we're, like Paul, we feel like, you know, it's a good thing to go to heaven. Listen, sometimes, God, you know, we, we get upset if, if, God takes, if God takes somebody home sooner than we want. Let me tell you something. There's nothing bad about heaven. Somebody help with that, amen? There's nothing wrong with that heaven. Isn't that, isn't that what we're trying to do is get people to go to heaven, Amen. I mean, let's just get excited about glory and get excited about the things of the Lord. He was fervent in the Lord. David said, the king's business requireth haste. Jehu said this, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Solomon said, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. John Wesley said, I just set myself on fire and people come to watch me as I burn. I'm just saying tonight, listen, people get attracted to coming to a church where the music's exciting, the preaching's exciting, the people's exciting, the class are exciting, the fellowship's exciting, the events are exciting. Whatever we do, we're excited because we have a people that are excited for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Are you exciting? Or are you kind of just dull and boring? You're kind of dead. Don't be cold. Don't be calculating. Listen, I'm going to say this tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little older, so I'm going to be a little more cantankerous about this, okay? But some of these Asian churches out there, they're filled with dead believers. They're filled with a lot of intellectualism with no desire for the things of God. They want to articulate upon things they want to be argumentative about. Listen, if you're going to debate about something, let's debate with the devil, but don't debate one another about the things of God. Amen? Some of you who got ties to these Asian churches, get out of those Asian churches that are dead and have nothing going on for Jesus. Get in this church, get involved, and get so many for Jesus. Amen? Be excited for the Lord. Be excited about what we're doing. Don't just come to, well, you know, just we're doing the same old, same old. Listen, with Jesus looking down from heaven, it's not the same old, same old. Every service is a destiny to be determined for a sinner who needs to get saved. Be excited. Man, we have song leaders up here. Our song leaders are excited. At least I try to get them excited, amen? I try to get our MCs excited. We read a missionary letter. Watch you excited. Listen, we come to class. I mean, you, you, if you're a children's teacher, you ought to be excited because, listen, those children are full of sugar and vinegar and stuff like that. I mean, if you're, if you're kind of dead, you're going to, I mean, you got to get more sugar to get them more excited. Amen? <laughs> Paul was a fervent spirit. Apollos was equipped. Apollos was exciting. Notice Apollos was enlightened. I love this part here. We're told in verse 25... He taught diligently the things of the Lord. He taught everything he knew. By the way, I like that phrase, the things of the Lord. Amen? Knowing only, let me say this. Do you underline those two words, knowing only? That's a great devotional thought. What you know right now, put it to good use. And when God feels he can trust you with something else, he'll give you something else to add to that knowledge. Amen? Amen? I tell sinners this all the time. They're debating, they're deliberating. You know, I don't know if I'm ready to get saved. I know about this. And I tell them this all the time. You know enough right now how to get saved. When I'm done preaching next Sunday morning at the Easter service, every sinner is going to know enough how to get saved. They don't need to know, well, I need to read through the whole Bible. First of all, you're not going to read through the whole Bible. 
Secondly, if you're going to read the whole Bible, you need somebody to read the whole Bible with you so they can help you interpret it. Amen? Because you don't have the Spirit, if you're unsaved, you don't have the Spirit of God inside you to help you interpret that. Only a believer has the Spirit of God to help them interpret the Word of God. Somebody help me with that. Amen? I mean, they need help with that there, okay? I'm just saying today, they know enough how to get saved. Listen, you know enough, being in this church, you know enough how to live for God. And you know enough to have a devotion with God. And you know enough to have a prayer life with God. And you know enough, you know enough how to serve the Lord. The Bible says knowing only the baptism of John. Now that's not good, that's not bad. He was limited. Uh, I've read one, one man who said, well, he was a halfway Christian. I don't think that's an appropriate term to say about Apollos. I don't think he was a halfway Christian. I believe that he had an earnest desire for the Lord. I believe that he knew the scriptures well enough. He just didn't know, he just did not know that the Messiah had come. I mean, he just didn't have that, that, that knowledge to know that the Messiah had come. And so we read something here. This is God's love and God's grace working Apollos. Now God brings Apollos, of all things, to Ephesus. Paul has gone to Ephesus. He's the first missionary church planter to go to Ephesus and preaches the word of God there. Now we know from, from history that he spent three diligent uh, uh, years there in Ephesus preaching the word of God. He took Priscilla and Aquila with him. They're laboring away and we're not told much about the fruit. I think they had some fruit, but we're not told much about the fruit of those disciples there. Paul felt compelled. It was time for him to move on and he told Aquila and Priscilla, I want you to stay down here. Now Aquila and Priscilla had been equipped by Paul. They had been trained by Paul how to win souls, how to make disciples, how to build the church, how to teach them how to give, how to teach them to get involved with God, how to get serving the Lord and on and on and on. And so Aquila and Priscilla were this mature couple. Aquila wasn't called to preach. Definitely Priscilla wasn't called to preach. Amen, you know? So they, were, they, they weren't, he wasn't called to preach. They were just faith, a faithful married couple serving the Lord, honoring Christ, doing what their pastor told them. They stayed there diligently to work the work of God. And God, God just sends this man by the name of Apollos there. Now, they didn't know Apollos from Adam when he first got there. And their introduction to Apollos, as we read our Bible there, he goes into the synagogue. Now, he had the same, he had the same pattern like the Apostle Paul. Um, Paul knew that if he wanted to get an audience, he needed to go to a synagogue where there were Jews, and out of respect to him because he was a seasoned rabbi, after everybody gave their announcements and said their things, they would ask, is there a visiting rabbi here that would like to say something? And Paul would seize upon that opportunity to stand up and say, yes, I have something to say. And he would start from the Old Testament and go and lead into what we now call the New and tell them about Jesus and talk about the Lord. And he would reason with them and instruct them in the ways of God. Well, Apollos did the very same thing. He went to the synagogue, and the Bible says this about Apollos there. It says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Now, I believe Apollos, as he went there in the synagogue, he's preaching about the same, the same, in the same context as John the Baptist would have done. I mean, I think as you read Matthew chapter 3, the recorded sermon there that John the Baptist gave to those Pharisees there, I think Apollos preached in the same fashion, in the same manner, with the same fire, with the same fundamentals, with the same fire, with the same faith. I think he preached that way towards those people there. And so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. I mean, listen, Paul has already paved the way. Paul has already said this, and there, everyone's sitting well, man, this guy, this guy, he can preach, and he's got some fire inside of him, and he's telling us about the Lord. But, but Kill and Priscilla, they, they, they knew their Bible well. And they knew there's something was missing in his message. And they knew as recorded in the scriptures, he knew only the baptism of John because he would get them up to this baptism of repentance that was preparing the way for the Lord, but he didn't go all the way in talking about the Lord and preparing it. The more he preached, they realized as he was bold in preaching that, that, that he didn't have a complete message there. So what did they do? Look at verse 26. It says, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard. I want you to notice two things. Number one, they took him unto them. To, to, the word took him unto them means this. It's literally like a parent taking their child by the hand and saying, hey, let me, let me show you something. And this idea that they diligently and lovingly were encouraging him. It also means to invite someone into your home as your guest for a meal, for a pleasant conversation. So if you can take, combine those meanings together, basically Achille and Priscilla befriended Apollos. They invited him over for a meal. They lovingly brought him under their wings. And the Bible says they expounded unto him the word of the Lord. 
It says they said, okay, you're preaching a great message, but did you know Jesus has come? Did you know the Messiah has come? Now, there, there can be some teachers or people that are eloquent. That could be any of us. Could be me, could be you. That might be somewhat offended if someone we didn't know says, well, I don't think your message is all there. And uh, that's, Apollo, you know, Achille and Priscilla had to have wisdom, discernment, and the love of Christ in their heart. And God just kind of brought this together. You can see what the Lord's doing here. The Lord brought Apollos, who God was using, brought him down there, brought him to Ephesus. He brought him up from Alexandria, Egypt, up to Ephesus, brings him across the path of Achille and Priscilla, this was a couple that was loving. By the way, that's the same couple that was encouraging to Paul. They brought Paul along and helped Paul during a time of financial difficulty, a time where he needed encouragement. And they did the same thing for this man by the name of Apollos. And the Bible says they took him and expounded or opened unto him. And I believe they, they, he found out this, this couple, they knew their Bible very well. As, uh, they knew their Bible very well too. And they just kind of told him, uh, they said, well, you remember Isaiah 53? Hey, he's already come. And he said, you remember here, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. This is when it happened. And they probably took him back to that Passover week that was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. And they, they took him out there and said, listen, Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled. Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled. David's prophecy was fulfilled. You remember that type in the Bible which speaks about the Passover lamb? That was fulfilled. John the Baptist saw him. And John the Baptist ceded his ministry over to Jesus. He said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He said, now we know that you respect John the Baptist and you're one of his disciples and you carry his fire and you carry that you carry that you carry that that faith of John but we want to tell you John said a man can receive nothing set to be given him by God he said he must increase and I must decrease and as they expounded unto him the scriptures and helped him understand they were, they were telling, taking Apollos back historically how Jesus was born in Nazareth how, how he was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth and then how he made his way to the Galilean cities made his way outside that to Gentile territories. And then how he made his way there to Jerusalem. And there at Jerusalem, he was led outside the city to the hill called Golgotha. He was crucified there. And then they took his body down before Passover began. And they took his body and his body was prepared. And they laid him in a grave. And three days later, praise the good Lord, he rose again from the dead. And I think they took the scriptures and showed him, listen, he fulfilled what David talked about there in Psalm 16. And he fulfilled there what Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 53 speaks of there. And they said, they told him, listen, remember, listen, Jesus, when he he's here, he talked, about, he talked about Jonah being a symbol of the resurrection. And he said, listen, he fulfilled all that and he sent it up to heaven. And they said, this, we want to tell you the essence of what we're telling you, the death, the resurrection, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says here, they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. He preached about the way of the Lord. He preached about the Messiah coming, but he preached about a Messiah in the context of John the Baptist preparing the way. And they said, listen, we're going to show you he's already come. You you don't have to leave them hanging there. You can tell them he's come, he's arrived, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead. You can tell them, listen, you can get saved right now by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And he led, they, they led him along the way and helped him understand it. And as we get through our Bible here, the Bible says they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And verse 27 says, at that moment, he was disposed. He said, man, this is great. They influenced him. He came into the knowledge of realizing that, listen, Jesus had come, and now everything had come to the place where he had full, complete knowledge about the things of God. And let me say this tonight about being enlightened. Ephesians 1.18 says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Let, let, me, let me give you a couple things here. Number one, I think what Achille and Priscilla did here gives you and me a pattern for helping someone who doesn't have complete knowledge about the scriptures. Take time with them. Love them in the Lord. Don't berate them. Don't belittle them. Help them in that. Secondly, let us all be humble enough to realize none of us have arrived either. Amen? That we need, we, you know, there may be some things we don't know about, and we're constantly in this process of learning. We must have a teachable spirit. I'm glad right here that we see there's a spirit of meekness that Achille and Priscilla had in going to Apollos, but I'm also thankful that Apollos had a spirit of teachability and meekness by which he received the Word of God. Listen, meekness must go both ways. Those of us in a spiritual leadership capacity, we must go to those who are in error, go to those who are wanting and needy. We must go to them with a spirit of meekness. That's what Galatians 6 1 says. Brethren, if any of you be overtaken a fault, ye which are spiritual, 
Restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thy own self. We must have that spirit of meekness. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.24 that when someone errs along the way, we must go to him in a spirit of meekness. By the same token, we must have that spirit of meekness by which we receive the engrafted word. We must be teachable. Ask the Lord every service you come to to give you a spirit of meekness to receiving his word. So we see Apollos. Here's this man. He was equipped. Here's this man. He was exciting. Here's this man, he was enlightened, but notice something else here. Go to verse 28. Here's this man, he was evangelistic. Now, the Bible says he spent some time in Ephesus, and then it says in verse 27, the Lord moved on his heart. He was moved or disposed. He was was convinced in his mind to go to Achaia. So he boarded a ship, went to the Grecian Isles, and he winds up going to Corinth there. I'll say more about that in a minute. Now, He goes there, and the Bible says he helped them much. But what I want to focus your thought on in verse 28, it says, there at Achaia, he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now, Apollos, it jumps out to me, did the work of an evangelist. The work of an evangelist is where his focus is on the preaching of the gospel, his focus is on getting people saved. His focus is on clearly explaining the gospel message where the Bible says here, he mildly convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now he was, he did an evangelistic work. An evangelist is a gift, is a gift from God. He's gifted by God in the preaching of the gospel. An evangelist uh, tends to be itinerant and goes from location to location to win people to the Lord. Um, we have the example, Philip was the first evangelist that's mentioned in scripture. Paul, I believe, was an evangelist. I believe this man, Apollos, was an evangelist. His fervency spirit moved into the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, an evangelist must be characterized by fervency and spirit in preaching the gospel. Now, sometimes a man could be specifically called of God. He has to get to the evangelist and going itinerantly from top place to place to place to preach the gospel. Our friend that who, who went to heaven to be with the Lord, Dr. Tom Farrell, was an example of that. He was a great evangelist. And days gone by, men like Hyman Appleman, men like that, and Charles Weigel, these men were itinerant itinerant evangelists. Lester Roloff was an itinerant evangelist. These men specialized in preaching the gospel. They had a heart and burden for that. Now, I believe there are many times a man that has to get to the evangelist does not necessarily have the gift of being a pastor. And uh, to put him in a pastor would be the wrong thing for him to do if he doesn't have the heart of a pastor. By the same token, I know of many pastors like myself that I believe also have the gift of the evangelist who have a concern for the preaching proclamation of the gospel. I think of someone like Dr. Ed Lorena. Dr. Ed Lorena will be with us for our missions conference. Dr. Lorena has the heart of a pastor, but he has the gift of the evangelist. I believe someone like Dr. Paul Chapel, great heart of a pastor. He's got a great pastor's heart, but he also has the gift of the evangelist. I think about Brother David Barnhouse, who's been with us this earlier this year. I believe he's a man who has the power, heart of a pastor, but the gift of the evangelist. I think of someone like Dr. Mike Norris or Dr. R. Bulette or Brother David Board or Brother Michael Gurmey, our missionary. I believe these men who are, who are our pastors also have the heart of evangelists. This man didn't evangelistic work. He mightily he convinced the Jews and that publicly. My, my prayer is that God would raise up a heart in our church, an evangelistic heart. I've said this in previous services. Everything about our church is wired for evangelism. There's no ministry we have that is not wired for evangelism. Every ministry of our church is wired to help people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. We have an unsafe family that's going to come next week. And if they drop their children off in the nursery, uh, they're going to know from our nursery workers, this is an evangelistic church. They drop their children off or their young people off to one of our young people's ministries, they're going to know this is an evangelistic work. Everything about this church is about reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Bay Area and California is that it might be saved. I'm asking God to call an evangelist out of this church. I'm asking God to put the heart of the evangelist in the heart of our men, that we would have men, even women, who would have a heart for communicating the gospel. I'm just saying tonight, as, as church members, as church family, as men, let's not play around. Let's get people saved. Amen? Let's be fervent about the gospel. Here's this man. He was evangelistic. Here was a man. He was equipped. Here was a man that was enlightened. Here was a man that was exciting. But finally, would you notice all that? And one more thing I want you to see. Because this man was fervent in spirit. Apollos was a man who was effective. Being effective means there was fruit in his preaching and his personal work. 
Being effective means he, he made a spiritual impact in lives. Would you ask God in these next 60 seconds to put in your heart to be an effective believer, an effective Christian, an effective member, not to be content with just doing things, but to keep doing things until it gets done. First, Apollos was effective in Ephesus. Go to chapter 19, and we read about 12 disciples that Paul, Paul makes his second trip back to Ephesus. And there's these 12 men that unusually stand out in Paul's mind. And Paul asks him, this is another message, another time, he noticed something was missing in their theology, if I could say that, or just where they're at in their faith. And he asked them in verse 2, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Now we correlate the two, there's a strong likelihood these disciples that he found there were under the influence of Apollos during the time he was there because all he knew and when he was at Ephesus, it was the baptism of John. It wasn't until after Achilla and Priscilla took him aside and, and discipled him and brought him to full knowledge that he felt disposed of the Lord at that time to go to Achaia. So we can say, I think I can say confidently, I believe that the time that Apollos was there, he mightily spoke the scriptures, he spoke eloquently, he spoke boldly in the synagogue, that there was some fruit, he was effective in his ministry. When we go from there, he not only was effective in Ephesus, we go to verses 27 and 20. 28, and this man was also effective in Corinth. I like what it says in verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. Now, um, I think along the way that as he came under the influence of Achille and Priscilla, they were sharing their testimony of how the Lord had used them and their ministry time they had with Paul at least 18 months there in Corinth. I think they spoke about uh, how God brought the church about, how, how people got saved, how people got baptized, and what the Lord was doing there at Corinth. And uh, the Lord started to move in, in his heart. Because remember, I said earlier, I believe this man, Apollos, had the heart of evangelist. I think he got a burden about this location and about going there and preaching the gospel because Paul was not there. And there was a pastor that was over that church then. But he felt like, you know what? Maybe I could come and be a help and blessing there as I was over here at Ephesus. And the Bible says he was disposed to go to Achaia. In other words, he felt an urging and leading of the Lord to go to Achaia. And so to go there, and we find Paul writing about this several times in the book of Corinthians, 1 and Corinthians, he needed a letter of reference. He needed someone to recommend him. He needed someone to kind of pave the way for him. And so the Bible says the brethren wrote a letter. And I believe the letter was initiated by Achille and Priscilla. They wrote a strong letter of recommendation about how this man came along the way. He preached fully the way of the Lord and it was a strong, mighty in the scriptures. And I believe that, and I believe there was the validation of the believers there at, at Ephesus. The Bible says they gave him this letter of recommendation. So it exhorted the disciples because they, they wouldn't know Apollos from Adam and uh, Paul had instructed every church he was in, you need to be careful about teachers who come from the outside in, and unless there's a strong recommendation, be very, very careful of them, vet them out, make sure you know their doctrine, make sure you know for sure whether or not they're, they're for real or not. So he gets these letters of recommendation, and it basically said this, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples at Achaia to receive him. Now we have a colon there, semicolon there. And then it tells us when he got to Achaia, Achaia who, that is Apollos, when he was come, he helped them much, which had believed through grace. Now, we get some insight about that when we get to 1 Corinthians 3. Because 1 Corinthians 3, Paul, Paul is a, you know, later on the church became carnal and he started following personalities. Some said, I'm a follower of Paul. And some said, I'm a follower of Peter. And some said, I'm a follower of Paul. Here's what Paul had to say on that. He said, I have planted, Apollos has watered. And when he gave much, when he helped them much, that phrase jumps out at me because if, unless you're in the pastor, you don't understand this. But when a, when a preacher comes in, like Brother Dave Hetzer did just a few weeks ago, he helped us much. Amen? 
He helped us much, okay? When David Barnhouse came earlier this year, he helped us much, amen? When we just have certain men of God that come here, they help us much. And Apollos was one of those men of God. He was effective there. God used his preaching ministry, his mightiness in the scriptures of informing, of building up, of equipping the believers. And through that, the Bible says in verse 28, people got saved along the way because there were converts, because Paul had planted. Now, Apollos was watering. Apollos was, was encouraging the ministry that Paul had. And the Bible says in verse 28, for he mightily convinced the Jews. When he might have convinced them, they came to the point of conviction. There was no argumenting. There was no debating. There was no hesitating. It brought them to the full place of realizing they needed to make a decision for Jesus Christ. He might have convinced the Jews, and that publicly, I think there were public decisions being made of people raising their hands, people going forward and receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, was he effective? Absolutely, he was effective. Should we be effective? Absolutely. We need to be effective in what we do. Effectiveness is measured. And souls being saved, disciples being developed, lives being changed, leaders being developed. I'm going to close in saying this. Everything about Apollos reflects a man on fire. When we're fervent in spirit, we get things done. And we get things done with excellence. When we're fervent in spirit, we help people much. Don't just do the little. Let's help them much. Amen? Be a blessing. When we're fervent in spirit, we keep exercising faith. And we keep going forward. That's what, it, that's what, that's what Apollos was doing. He, he felt disposed in his heart. He'd done what he could at Ephesus. The Lord was moving him on to Achaia. When you're fervent in spirit, you're a godsend to other people. He was a godsend. God sent him there. He was a godsend at the right time, right moment. When we're fervent in spirit, you're a blessing. I want to encourage us tonight. Get equipped. Be exciting. When there's something you don't know, seek out a spiritual brother and sister in Christ. Be enlightened. Be evangelistic. Be effective. Be like Apollos, who was a man on fire, who was a man with a mission. Let's be men and women with a mission on fire for the Lord. Would you be excited for the Lord? Would you be an equipper? Would you be effective in getting things done? Let's do that for the glory of God. Then as we look at verse 28, I want to close with saying this. He mightily convinced the Jews and publicly showing them that Jesus was a Christ. He pointed people to the Lord. If you're here tonight, and you're watching by live stream, you're not sure you're going to heaven, you're not saved, the whole essence of this message is to point you to Christ. And we encourage you to get saved this evening. We want you to know that Jesus has come. Jesus died for your sins. And Jesus, Jesus offers to you the free gift of eternal life. Receive Christ tonight. Be saved this evening. Don't play games with God. Be serious with God and live for God.